Good morning. It's Wednesday, September the 7th. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System, and we're coming to you live from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. Today is Show Me the Science. We're talking about using artificial intelligence in making a time-critical diagnosis of a silent killer. Every year, one in five adults admitted into a hospital develops acute kidney injury, or AKI. It is a serious, fast-moving condition that can take your life. And the incidence of AKI is also rapidly increasing with cases doubling each year. But there is hope on the horizon in better diagnosing AKI using artificial intelligence. It works being by, uh, there's work being done by two researchers here at the University of Kansas Medical Center that was recently published in JAMA. Our experts today are Dr. Mei Lu, an associate professor of medical informatics in the Department of Internal Medicine, and co-author Dr. Alan Yu, who is director of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. We will also hear from the Vice President and Chief Informatics Officer here at the, the Health System and at the Med Center, Chris Harper. He's going to talk a little about the future of AI in healthcare. And as always, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, has our COVID count. Our Show Me the Science episodes always start with the terms you will hear us talk about while discussing the research. Let's begin with what is AI. We've all come to understand the Hollywood version of artificial intelligence. But how is AI used in medicine? I'll turn to Chris Harper to help explain how the health system is rapidly increasing its use of AI in the care of patients. Chris. Hey, good, good morning. So, you know, um, one of the things that, that you guys are gonna regret inviting a nerd to the um, to this show, because I'm gonna give you a quick history lesson of, of not only how we're using it, but, you know, why we are at the stage we are at, which is, you know, if you think about Back in the 90s and 2000, um, healthcare systems have really focused on delivering and implementing and, and really digitizing the, the paper record into um, uh, what's known as electronic health record systems. And, and since then, since the 2000 to uh, 2010s, that we've been really creating what's called the interoperability and using third party systems to make the, the health uh, EHR systems really um, useful. Well, what that's done is really created a vast amount of data that um, we now need help of machines or, or commonly known as AI, artificial intelligence, to be able to make really sense of that dumb and static data into a useful information. And so uh, what you're seeing is that today from a health system perspective, you know, we're making a lot of investments into um, innovation, but also how do we practically use uh, the data and turn it into that intelligence using these capabilities. And so, um, you know, those are kind of the quick history lesson uh, of where we're at. And then, you know, a couple of things I'll mention also is that, you know, um, we focus on using these data and, and AI capabilities safely and securely. And so what we've been really doing um, is, is we created what's called a AI center of excellence for the health system. And we partner with uh, a group out of uh, bioethics to be able to create a, a a safe usage for the patient, but also how do we put the, the human at the center of our uh, AI capability? And so slowly we would make it investments and not only in the people, but the technology to be able to do that um, in, in a scalable way. So Chris, here's what I want to know, being another nerd and a science fiction nerd, are the five, are Isaac Asimov five, I think it's five laws of robotics, part of AI programming? You know, um, there's, there's different, different um, ways to look at that. Um, you know, you, you mentioned some of the science, science fictions movies that portray these, you know, intelligent robots that act as, as a humanoid, but we're not there yet. So you, you look at the, the hype that's created around these technologies. Uh, really there's, there's, you know, um, we're, we're moving towards some of those um, autonomous robotics and, and what's commonly known as a, a a general AI capability, and, and we're, we're years or decades from that, but what we are able to do is what's called a data-centric or model-centric AI capability that our, our two physicians here are also using to, to solve a, a healthcare problem. So we're not at that, that scientific level, and we do look at, you know, a bunch of nerds look at every year on uh, what's called a Turing testing, where, you know, um, 
you know, does, does really artificial intelligence equal human intelligence? And we're not there yet from a capability. Yeah, I just let our, our listeners know that uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, brilliant science fiction writer, had the five laws of robotics, which basically meant robots can't, couldn't hurt people and always had to help folks. But um, I don't know if AI is going to help me balance the checkbook or not. We'll, we'll find out in a minute. Um, let's talk to our visit to our, our folks here in the, ta- the, the, in the studio with me. Um, as regarding today's study, first of all, tell us what acute kidney injury really is, Alan. Sure, Steve. So acute kidney injury refers to uh, a sudden onset of a decline in kidney function, usually over hours to days. Uh, It's usually caused by one of three things. Either there's a decrease in the blood supply to the kidney, usually caused by things like shock, a direct toxic uh, insult to the kidney from medications or procedures, or uh, blockage to urine outflow from uh, obstruction. It's essentially a plumbing problem. Uh, And because the kidney gets rid of fluid and toxins when that happens, fluid accumulates, uh, particularly in the lungs. Uh, Toxins accumulate like potassium that can cause heart arrhythmias. uh, And toxins can accumulate in other places like in the brain that can cloud one's thinking and cause what's called encephalopathy. And in the most severe cases, patients need to have dialysis. uh, And these complications can uh, greatly increase the risk of death. Yeah, I did, as an ICU doctor for over a quarter of a century, I'll tell you, when your kidney, inf- kidney function started going down, you knew you were in trouble. Mm-hmm. And so the whole goal, or one of the major goals of critical care and hospital care now is to make sure we keep the kidneys healthy because we know that when we don't, the risk of death and the risk of bad outcomes or prolonged recoveries goes up remarkably. And uh, we try to do those things that are going to help take care of the kidneys. So, uh, Absolutely. How is, uh, team, how is, um, what, how is AI being used to help diagnose and prevent um, kidney injury? <laughs> Well, currently um, there are kind of kidney um, AKI detection uh, systems implemented in the hospital where it can uh, it, it look at looks at the serum craning values and then can um, produce early warning uh, signals uh, in the electronic health record systems. Um, so currently I, we are working on how to predict risk before the onset. Um, yeah. So essentially the creatinine is a measure in your serum, and there's other things we can measure in your blood that tell us the kidneys aren't as happy. And so the, the, the technology is trying to find that, and then does it tell the, the, the providers, the physicians, whoever, hey guys, you got a problem here, better start looking at this. Is mm-hmm. that sort of the message? Yes, yes. All right, good. So I see the artificial intelligence here in the center of the table has helped to figure out what that might be. I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, all right, the study refers to taking a personalized prediction approach. Now, that's a big, those are big terms. I was going to help us with that. Using artificial intelligence to diagnose AKI. AKI. How does that differ from current predictive models used to develop who might develop a kidney injury. So there's different kinds of predictive models, Alan. You're going to have to help us figure that out a little bit. Yeah. What does uh, all that so mean? So to be honest, right now, our predictive models are pretty uh, crude, right? So yeah, as it's you just me looking at the record in the labs and thinking, okay, things are going south. Yeah, so the, there are two ways of, of doing this. One is to look at this value of the serum creatinine, which the kidney normally gets rid of, uh, and so when that number starts to go up, we know that acute kidney injury is happening, but the horse is already out of the barn by that time. Right. Uh, but we know there are certain patients that are at risk, uh, older patients, patients with obesity, diabetes, patients who get certain procedures like cardiac catheterization, certain medications, and so on. Uh, But that's a pretty blunt instrument. That covers a lot of patients in the hospital of which only a minute proportion actually develop acute kidney injury. And so what we desperately need is a finer instrument to precisely determine which patients among those is going to get acute kidney injury. And so what, is the, what, what are the labs or what are the, thing, what are the signals that the, 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 this uh, artificial intelligence is looking at, Dr. Liu, besides creatinine, if that's not the right? Yeah, uh, so, in, so in our model right now, we are including so what it's actually looking at, in addition to the serum creatinine, it's also looking at all the other labs, all the vital signs. Um, 
medications that the patient is taking, and also looking at what procedures the patient has undergone during um, their stay at the hospital. So let's really so think many, it many very things. broadly, right? Yes. This is how you all do. You teach us as residents, you're supposed to look at all these broad things, but as you get to be older, you only focus on a few things. But the AI is going to try and help you do that. Yes. It uses something called transfer learning. You're going to have to tell me what transfer learning is. What does that mean to personalized medicine? Yeah, so transfer learning is actually a new field of learning in machine learning. Um, it's, uh, its aim is to improve learning on a um, new task based on what the machine has learned from a, a related task. So for example, um, a machine um, can uh, learn how to recognize a truck based on what the machine has learned from recognizing a car. So we utilize mm -hmm. this same concept for AKI prediction. And it's important for personalized um, modeling because you know, the conventional way of building a prediction model is to um, train your model uh, using a particular population, data from a particular population. And then the model can be applied to the new patient. But for per uh, personalized prediction modeling, the, uh, the difference is actually you are training a model dynamically for each individual patient coming into the hospital. So you are actually training the model based on similar patient data. And this reduces the number of samples you can feed into the model for training. Um, so that will actually degrade the performance of machine learning because machine learning is data hungry. It needs a lot of data for training. So transfer learning in this sense mitigates the small sample size problem. Well, that sounds almost human because the machine is learning to do something that I didn't program it to do. How did it do that without being sentient? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did it do it without having a real, sta a real state of consciousness, guys? Well, it learns from data that has similar characteristics, right? So it's okay. looking at what is essential, what are the variables that's important for both tasks. So it's always correlating that stuff yes. together, and yes. then it says, ah, these are the most important mm -hmm. variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's it. That's pretty cool. So um, your work's considered a cohort study. Can you define cohort study? Yeah, so cohort study is a form of a longitudinal observational study where you can define a cohort based on common characteristics. And then you cross-section as the um, across time inter intervals, right? So the, uh, they can be prospective or retrospective or both. And our study is a retrospective cohort study where we define the cohort um, as an adult inpatient population, and then we extract the data from those patients uh, during their stay, and then train the model. So mm. it's a, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So cohort really is just says, we're studying this group of folks with some similar characteristics. In this case, they were hospitalized inpatients, and we're gonna watch them over time. There'll be different patients over different times, and you're trying to look for information that trains the machine on how to think. Yes. Okay, Harper, do you think I'm trainable? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, that's still to be seen. I've only been here 10 years, so the, the, the jury's still out there. <laughs> There's still hope. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I think the people in the back of the studio think the answer to that is no at the moment. Okay. <laughs> the, re the study used information in an EHR for research. We want everyone to know that the study that we were doing here uh, was compliant with all HIPAA things, et cetera. And that, that means all the information is, is kept you know, um, de-identified. So tell us how the data in EHRs was used, though, and why, team. I think, Chris, that's probably best to you. Yeah, you know, um, um, you know what we've been doing, as mentioned earlier, is you know digitizing the record, so to speak. And so today, for the health system, roughly we have over 3.5 petabytes worth of data in our our, our um, healthcare. And if I translate that into some of the useful, um, you know, uh, um, context, really, you know, um, a 50 petabyte. Uh, is the entire record of, of, of human um, kind from the beginning to the end with all languages. So it's, it's a tremendous amount of data. And what the team has done is really create a, a what's called a data um, a system that's able to um, really uh, work with uh, researchers like we have here to be able to, to use different modeling techniques, uh, different data-centric AI capabilities to really uh, make sense of it using things like predictive modeling and so forth. And so you know, today, um, the, the exciting thing is, you know, we're at a new age uh, of medicine and science that we're able to apply more of these AI techniques and we're just at the cusp really at, at using that, that record that we've been creating for the last 20 years and really making intelligence out of those uh, data and the systems.
It is amazing to think about what the future of AI and medicine is, because you sort of hearkened at it here about, look at all the information we've gotten in the EHR, and I'm just, I'm fascinated. So I grew up in the era of paper charts, right? You wrote everything down, and then when a patient came back for a follow-up visit, you hope you wrote it all down, and then you got to find all the pieces of information, you'd spend time trying to find all the information, and you'd be grumpy about it, because sometimes, I, mean, I remember going up to radiology sometimes, I could spend an hour looking, just looking to find where the chest x-ray went. Now the information's all there at my fingertips, but there's immense, immense amount of information and trying to digest it all and keep track of it can be hard. Is AI going to help us with that in the future? And talk to us a little bit about what is the future of AI in medicine? If I watch Star Trek and Star Wars, it sort of displaces people. Is that what, do you see that happening? I, I think so. Um, you, know, like you think I'm going to get displaced? Uh, Wait a minute, Harper, <laughs> that's the wrong answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so I, I think the goal is really you cannot displace how humans um, um, make decisions or interact, right? And so what we're doing really is how do we augment our, our, um, our, our physician and, and caregivers with the, the intelligence and the smart inf uh, information to be able to um, improve care and outcomes. And so, um, interestingly, I know Dr. Uh, Lou just mentioned about uh, uh, machine learning. And, and, and funny thing is, I bet everybody on this call or, or, or watching this have participated in, in training machines. So I don't know if um, uh, folks that have, whether it's a, a Apple phone or a website you enter into, sometimes it'll display things, you know, make sure I'm not a robot. And it'll ask you to click on, you know, a, a, a mosaic of picture to say, okay, what does it look like a, a car or a, 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 a sidewalk? And you click on these images. Essentially what you're doing is training Google uh, uh, machine learning capability to detect these different images. And then you're actually training that, that, that uh, machine learning capability that's on the, the Google side. And so uh, like Dr. Lou said, I think we're, as a society, more and more data is generated, not just on the, the medical and the healthcare side, but uh, from a human perspective. And, and eventually that's gonna lead to innovations that are really um, coming to the forefront of making things easier to use. So, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do and invest into from a health system perspective is how do we make it easier for our, our clinician really to be able to uh, make sense of, you know, vast amount of data and, and turn it into intelligible uh, insight. So, for instance, you know, our, our physicians spend a ton of time, you know, um, clicking through different electronic record systems to be able to uh, get to the answer they need. While the new using AI capability, now they're able to uh, the, the machines are able to tee those things up so that you don't have to click uh, 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 on five different things to get to the answer you're looking for. Which is pretty impressive. I'm just impressed that there's right. I can see a patient who's been in an epic hospital and I can look at their charts and see all the information they had. I mean, that's revolutionary, honestly, to taking care of patients. And I guess that's really not machine learning, but I want to go back to that Google thing for a minute. So when I click, I'm not a robot and I'm looking at those pictures, I'm actually doing something for Google, not, I'm working for Google. It's not that that's a big security like screen I, or something. <laughs> wow. No, though, actually that's exactly a machine learning technique that Google uses. And, and you know, think about, uh, like Dr. Lou said, um, um, you know, these machines are dumb until you train it. And, and you know, you need, a, again, a, a vast amount of data, but really also uh, a data continues to shift, right? So um, I always tell my team and the physicians that, you know, the ER, EHR record you stepped in yesterday is different today because of all the new data that's coming in. And so uh, without these AI capabilities, you know, we're going to be at a point where there's too much data for us to be able to compute, for, so to speak, from a human perspective. And we need these uh, assistance from these intelligence to be able to, um, to help us in a sense. Or is it going to finally be able to help me watch the Royals games eventually uh, so I can get rid of ballet sports or whatever? Is that a future part of the thing too? Well, I'm sure it's already doing some of that. Um, I don't know if people know, but, you know, I uh, had a chance to talk to some of the MLB teams and, you know, uh, I don't know if it's going to help you watch it, but, you know, uh, sports today uses so much of data to be able to make intelligence. So, for instance, I know the, a lot of the major league teams uh, capture how many times the ball rotates in a single pitch, and then they look at the angle of of those uh, rotations to be able to help understand, you know, is this going to be a type of, of ball it is? And then actually the, a lot of the teams use that data to make hitting improvements, right? And so, but from a viewership perspective, 
you know, there's already information out, out, out there about you and, and how, um, you know, you like to consume those type of sports event. And so I'm sure in the future it's going to, you know, prompt you to maybe click on something that, you know, um, you know, uh, for your favorite team or, or things like that in the, the coming future. All right. So, Alan, is this going to put you out of business? Because if we don't have acute kidney injury in the hospital, where are you going to get dialysis from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it'll, it'll reduce acute kidney injury, and that'll be a great thing. It will be a but great there'll thing. be plenty of other kidney disease to yeah, tackle. Diabetes and mm -hmm. high blood pressure and, and oh, all sorts sure. of other things. So mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit. Or is your team already using quite a bit of AI in their daily rounds? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, and we're really looking forward to uh, these smart folks uh, on your show today developing the tools that we can use. That would be very cool. That'd be very cool. All right. Speaking of, now is the time for our viewers to send in questions about any terms you hear us say questions about AI, as well as COVID questions. The links are on your screen. Speaking of COVID, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, joins us with the COVID count for today. How are we doing? Hi. Well, see, we pushed up a little bit. I think we were in the mid-teens. Yeah. I want the for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 19 active right now, 13, uh, three in the ICU, one in the ventilator, 16 in that recovery period. But just as we said, probably about mid to late July, we actually saw that peak of that long plateau um, of cases and hospitalizations. I think as a nation, we're still doing well. Hopefully our numbers will start to uh, decrease as well. Yeah, I think they're gonna go back down because we're seeing that trend nationally, mm -hmm. et cetera. And yeah. Okay, so Hawk, big news coming out of the CDC yesterday, right? Yeah. Not only are they saying that you can't use the old boosters anymore, you gotta now use the bivalent booster. Yeah. But now they're saying, get your booster and you're probably gonna get it once a year, yeah. just like the flu shot, unless things really change or unless you've got a lot of other health conditions. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, so first of all, let's, say, let, let, let's be clear. We still are using the monovalent, the first uh, edition of the vaccines for those primary series. I think that's important yep, for everyone important. to understand. Good point. Uh, the bivalent, uh, but, but that may change. You know, I think it's gonna be hard moving forward exactly what to predict. Number one, are you going to be infected one or once or twice a year? That's going to be a natural infection boost. Uh, what is your um, affinity for getting that booster? We know that, unfortunately, those people that were up uh, due for boosters um, who were in the hospital did not get them. And so I think there's just um, kind of a national fatigue about that as well. So we'll have to see. I mean, certainly we'll wait for those recommendations. But right now, really anybody 12 and over who received their last booster you know, two months ago or their last dose two months ago is eligible at this point in time. We'll have to see moving forward exactly. But um, yeah, certainly they talked about just as a yearly flu vaccine, possible yearly coronavirus vaccine as well. And it may shift. You know, they, there's also the thing with influenza. If you get your vaccine really early and there's another bump late in the late uh, yeah. in the spring, you can get another influenza vaccine. That's probably not gonna be too different what's gonna end up with COVID. We've settled into this pattern where we're seeing COVID. The other thing the CDC cited is right now, there's not another variant on the horizon. Yeah. And you're just kind of sitting back waiting. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Why yeah. is there not another variant? Interestingly, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a transplant program director yesterday, and he was saying that, uh, at another hospital, and, and he was saying that, gosh, BA5 hasn't been as bad on the mm -hmm. transplant population. Mm -hmm. So you wonder, okay, there's not another variant. Maybe, yeah. B, I think BA5 is still bad in people who've never had it, but if you've got all the drugs, you got you know, your vaccine instead, not as bad. Um, we're only gonna get a vaccination perhaps once a year. Is this good news? Is this kind of where we're gonna land for an endemic time? Yeah, yeah, I think it's good news. I mean, obviously less medicines, less uh, vaccines as possible. However, we know the vaccines right now that we have are exceptionally well at protecting against disease. And we don't have a lot of history with that because the vaccines came out before we were born. So we don't understand the full impact of how much the vaccines have improved uh, our daily life and our quality of life. But also understand that I think the best data that we have does show that really about that six month period after that last dose is when you have that higher risk, especially if you are in those higher risk categories such as age and other comorbidities. So I think we'll just have to kind of wait and see, but I think it is good news at this point in time no other variants of concern on the horizon. The last few obviously have been those Omicron uh, subvariant lineage, lineages. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens next. Uh, we know that the virus is constantly changing. Um, so we'll kind of wait for that. And I think overall, yes, it has been good. 
with the number of reported cases, but also those unreported cases that we have talked about, we haven't seen that huge surge in hospitalizations like we did in that early Delta and early Omicron period. Yeah, I like that. So we got a number of COVID-19 questions we we're not able to get to on our show yesterday. Yeah. The first comes from viewer Joelle, and she wants you to help us clarify the guidelines for mm -hmm. receiving the new COVID booster because, mm -hmm. and even since that question was submitted yesterday, yeah. they changed. So we sort of hit on it just a moment ago. Yeah, I mean, right now it's pretty simple. If you are two months out from your last dose, whether that's the primary series or your last booster, and you are 12 and over, it is recommended that you get this new bivalent uh, booster, this updated booster, as we're seeing if you look on the CDC website, uh, they refer to it as the updated booster. So. Yeah, and I think it's, I think that's right. And I think what the CDC is trying to say to you, to you, you point this out, COVID and vaccination fatigue. Mm -hmm. Look, if you get back, if you get yep. your primary series, two shots and or with, with uh, the mRNA vaccines, and with Novavax, um, and then you would get a booster once a year. And yeah. the mRNA looks like the waves we're going to go because we can pivot it so fast, and just as we have now, and it's got the mix of B, um, B4 and B5 as well as the original one, you'll get that once a year unless you're immunocompromised yeah. or you're older and yep. haven't defined older yet. And we would also say that they do anticipate younger age groups, younger than 12 uh, recommendations coming out soon as well. And also, if you uh, were, your children were uh, under 18, so in that 12 to 18 range, and they did get Moderna, it is okay to go ahead and get Pfizer for that new updated booster as well. Yeah, or flip-flop the other way, right? You can go either direction. And, yeah, it's uh, just Moderna is only 18 and above, Pfizer is yep, 12 and yep, above. Yep, yep, so, yep. so you All can right. mix and match. Yin Lang has two questions, and she asked about the safety of mixing the old generation and the next generation yeah. of vaccine. I think the old generation means what we've been using, the next generation is bivalent. No problem mixing those vaccines. No, absolutely not, and, and that's what we will be doing again. So, however, if you are haven't been vaccinated yet, which I think there's probably not many people who want to get vaccinated who haven't been at this point in time, you will be getting that first generation. The boosters will be that uh, for that uh, those, those booster, not primary series but it's certainly okay to mix those. What is the safety? You know, we, we do believe the safety is gonna be the same exact safety profile, and certainly the early data support that as the original vaccines. Will it be as efficacious? Well, certainly from antibody studies, it looks like the antibody titers are a little bit higher in, in the booster dosing. But overall, we have to remember that the vaccines we currently have, if you are up to date, continue to protect you from hospitalization, severe disease, uh, and death very, very well. How much will this new booster affect that and improve those, uh, improve those rates? It's difficult to say. We will be looking for that clinical data. But overall, if you remember, we've talked about B cells, antibodies, and T cells. Really, those, uh, that part of our immune system that protects us from severe disease and death is really that T cell component of our immunity. And from what we know, the areas on the spike that our T cells recognize really are unchanged. They are conserved. And so that is one of the reasons why those vaccines that we have, not the new uh, bivalent, but those old vaccines, uh, first generation, continue to work very well. They do continue to work well. We see that, as you pointed out, in our ICU all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're fully vaccinated and you've had all your boosters, yeah. And um, uh, you're, you're not going to be in the ICU, essentially, unless you have some severe chronic underlying disease like yeah. transplant or kidney failure, et cetera. So the other thing I think to point out is that the early use authorization for the current monovalent boosters is ending. Mm -hmm. And now you'll only be able to get the bivalent yes. boosters for your, for, as a booster. You can get the monovalent ones mm -hmm. for the original series. All right, so lots of good. Uh, uh, also, Yen Ling wanted to know how many doses the next generation vaccine should we get? You can get one dose, right? And then it's supposed to be good for one year unless you're in one of these high risk categories. Yeah, currently it is just for uh, this first updated booster dosing if you are two months or more from your last dose of vaccine. Yep. All right, New York Times heat map continues to show the United States. Um, overall in the world, it's kind of a, uh, a bit of a challenging place. Still some red zones over there in the southeast and the southern kind of Atlantic region and over in the far west and even, yes, right here in the Midwest. But overall, better than what it was a few weeks ago. But, you know, honestly, there's still quite a bit of transmission. Let's not get cocky yet. Uh, and, and we're going to be heading into the colder months, November, December. And that'll be the challenge that we all face going forward. Okay. We are back with doctors. I'm going to say it right. May Lou. Did it that's three times today and have done all right. And Dr. Allen Yu talking about their study using artificial intelligence to predict acute kidney injury. And Chris Harper, the chief informatics officer, 
who knows a thing or two about applying AI in medicine. And by the way, just a shout out to Harper. Do you realize he's a really smart guy? He used to play football at K-State, and he's still this smart. That's pretty impressive. I'm not talking K-State's not going to make you smart. I'm just thinking about all the head stuff. So smart man. He survived all those years in football. That's awesome. All right, folks. It was not hard to make the case for your body of work. I was struck by a couple of ideas of, of slide, a couple of slides I saw related to your study that clearly illustrate the need to do better diagnosing this kind of kidney injury very quickly. I want to start with the graphic showing a steady increase in acute kidney injury. My question is, prior to this study, were we getting better at diagnosing AKI or do the numbers reflect a rising tide? Walk us through that graph. Yeah, sure. There you go. Um, I don't think that's the right graph. but <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that shows it's deadly and expensive. How about the one prior to that? Yeah. But you could probably talk to us suddenly, but talk to us about why is there this rising rate of acute kidney injury, Alan? Uh, yeah, so there are a couple of things. So one is that we're perhaps getting a little bit better at diagnosing acute kidney injury. Um, so there, there are data with diagnostic codes that show that. Uh, but there's also a real increase in acute kidney injury, and we know that because uh, we can uh, look in integrated healthcare systems where creatinine can be measured or uh, we can capture all the patients getting dialysis, and it's clearly going up quite fast. I think the data that was flashed up on the screen showed about a 50% increase over six years. Uh, why is this happening? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. One is demographic. Our population is getting older, more obese, more diabetes, or risk factors. Uh, I think that we are doing more uh, invasive, life-saving, but invasive procedures. There is an increased instance, as you know, of sepsis and decompensated heart failure that's coming into this hospital. Uh, and we are having great advances in treatments of cancer. Uh, and that's all good, uh, but people are surviving longer from them and developing complications from all these amazing medications, uh, one of which is acute kidney injury. Yeah, you know, so sicker, longer living. And, and that, that clearly, the kidneys, I'm not trying to insult your organ there, sir, but it is a little bit of a wimpy thing. It, and, and it takes a lot of abuse, in fairness, because the kidneys are supposed to filter out all these toxic metabolites. And sometimes those toxic metabolites that are in your body are toxic to the kidney itself. And then we have to get worried, right? And, and people get sick. You know, I, I take care of a lot of cystic fibrosis patients, and we've often given them lots of poisons over the years to kill the bacteria that were invading their body. And sometimes those do a lot of kidney injury. So we see a lot of chronic kidney disease in the patient population. And now these CF patients are living a lot longer, and we're saying, oh my gosh, now we're having to start worry, really worried about what the long-term effect of those drugs are on their kidneys. And uh, hopefully we won't, with the new therapy, we won't have to keep doing that. But man, it's been a real, it's a challenge sometimes to manage the chronic disease without trying to cause chronic injury to a kidney too. Absolutely. So, all right, AKI is potentially deadly and expensive. That slide popped up. Let's get back to that slide. Show us a slide, kind of explain these numbers. Well, what is this slide trying to tell us, Alan? Yeah, so it's t telling us two things. One is that there is an increased risk of death. Uh, so firstly, this is um, uh, a Harvard study looking at the burden of acute kidney injury, and it showed that about 3.5% of admissions have acute kidney injury. So if you extrapolate that, that's about 1.2 million Americans per year getting acute kidney injury. That's a lot. Yeah. And if you get acute kidney injury, your odds of death are greatly increased for the most severe forms of acute kidney injury, about a 50-fold 50, 50 increase in risk of death. Uh, and, and that translates to, a, 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 I think, about 350,000 deaths per year. Uh, in addition to that, um, among those that survive, uh, hospital stay has increased, an average of about three and a half days. And because of that, uh, cost of admissions has increased on average about $7,500 per admission, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply it by those patients, that's uh, about $9 billion. That's a lot of money. So, Alan, can your kidneys recover from this injury? Can they get better? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So once the, uh, the, the inciting event has stopped, uh, if the kidneys still have some uh, residual uh, tubules, that's the functioning part of the kidney that are surviving, uh, they can slowly repair themselves and recover. Uh, unfortunately, they don't always get back to normal, so you can 
uh, recover part of the way and develop chronic kidney injury, uh, which is what's shown on this graphic. So there's a risk of chronic kidney disease that proceeds over time. Uh, these patients are at risk of uh, leaking protein in their urine, having high blood pressure, and all of those together conspire to cause your kidneys to deteriorate slowly over time so that you eventually can get kidney failure, uh, not immediately, but perhaps years later instead. And then you go on dialysis potentially, and dialysis, while it certainly will save your life, is not a panacea. It's really hard on people three times a week, four hours at a time in the dialysis. And, and honestly, patients on dialysis don't live that long. Yeah, it's an imperfect therapy, and uh, we're doing our best to improve it and develop better forms of dialysis, uh, but ultimately kidney transplant is the better procedure. Uh, it's just that there's a limit on the number of kidneys available. And it's not available to everybody. Exactly. So, man, we really want this AI thing to help us work a little bit better. So we've talked about the AI, AI model being a better predictor of kidney injury to help limit the kidney. How much better is it? Um, so, based on our study, um, so in our study, well, we are comparing our per personalized model against the conventional predictor model. We are assessing the area under the uh, receiver operating curve, or AUROC. So this is a measure that's essentially a balance between a true positive rate and a false positive rate. Uh, so it's an inherent uh, uh, assessing the inherent validity of the algorithm. It's performance in discriminating who will develop AKI versus who will not develop AKI in the hospital. So for in our study, we show that a personalized predictor model showed an, an average increase of 4% in terms of AUROC over the traditional modeling approach um, in, uh, for AKI prediction. And especially in the high-risk subgroups, um, the increase can be as high as 13% for those who undergone you know, liver transplant, and uh, you know other high-risk um, subgroups patients. So it's early, but clearly showing it better than us, than the, the, the docs or the providers just looking at the nursing tech team, just looking at the page and saying, ah, oh, this is kidney injury. The model is better at doing that than just routine eyes and routine care, which is encouraging. Sounds like we still have more work to do to make it better, and then you have to look at it going forward. You've looked at it going backwards, now you look at it going forward and say, show, show me the difference, right? Yes. Tested That's pretty cool. Perspectively. <laughs> so, Dr. Lyra, when you first started your work on this back in 2018, you thought you'd be building a, um, a, a new and improved global model. Is that still what's going on? Uh, or, or tell me, when did you realize there would be a better way than the old way? Yeah, so we built the, you know, the model, the traditional way, right, conventional way of building a model and testing it. But we want to test the robustness of the model as well, right? It, the model needs to perform well across different patient uh, populations. And especially for AKI, it's a heterogeneous uh, disease. It has many um, clinical causes. So we want to test it in different subgroups of patients. So um, in addition to the traditional subgroups literature, you know, that has been tested in the literature, like, you know, age group, um, different uh, people who fall into different serum craning uh, groups. We also tested on um, subgroups that has high risk of developing AKI based on their admission diagnosis. And when we did that, we saw the variation in the performance. Mm -hmm. So that Looks led good. us to the personalized predictor modeling yeah, approach. Yeah, very, very <laughs> cool. So if between a four and 10% improvement in our ability to predict it, how much better do you think we're gonna get beyond that as the model mm -hmm. gets smarter from your machine learning? <laughs> How much better? Yeah. <laughs> We're hoping it can reach at least over 90% in terms of AUROC. I mean, you know, 100%, I don't think we're ever going to get there. Right. <laughs> yeah. But if you, get, if you can pick up 90% of kidney injury early so we can intervene early, that's going to make a big difference, Alan. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think what's exciting about this is not just picking up acute kidney injury, but May's approach uh, allows us to identify within each individual what those specific risk factors are, which are going to be different between which different is key, patients. Because then you can try and take away those risk factors. Absolutely. You, can mitigate them. you may yeah. not have even otherwise realized that that was the risk factor. Exactly. That is pretty cool medicine mm. right there. That is. Show me the science. I love that. That's great. All right, so what excites you, May, the most about all this? The process of building an AI model that actually have a clinical impact. Yes. You know? Yeah, because it's so exciting to see how AI is enabling us to see 
what we cannot see really in the uh, massive data, right, with the human eyes. So it's usually exciting. It is. After this, I want you to work with Hawkeye and try and figure out the same thing for risk of infection as opposed to risk of kidney disease. <laughs> Dana, that would be applicable in your world of, of work as well. What's, you know, what's the bad infection? What's not? Absolutely. We, and I think going through those uh, models, you know, there's certainly uh, things, large, broad strokes that we can look at, uh, but certainly there's also those very intricate details for. Yeah, for that is well. cool. I think some of the uh, broad things, though, would be hand washing. <laughs> exposure <laughs> wearing your mask. Yes. You, know, you mean the rules of infection control yes, that's continue absolutely. to travel with you and keep you yeah. safe wherever you go <laughs> Alan you what excites you the most about all this AI future yeah I think one thing that that may didn't mention is that as opposed to the conventional AI which is a sort of black box approach she's actually developing an interpretable model so we can actually look at these factors that she's identified and look for new things that might be causing acute kidney injury and more importantly combinations of things that we're doing that we would never be able to spot those patterns, but her model is able to, to spot new things that might be causing acute kidney injury. So May seems pretty young. I just want to say that getting published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, that's a pretty darn big deal. That's one of the top flight journals in the U.S. It certainly is, and it's a first for me too. So Excellent. I'm delighted to be a co-author on it. Excellent. Okay, question. Uh, Chris, what excites you the most about the future of AI? You know, um, what excites me most is, um, you know, the vast amount of available data that we can now provide to our researchers. So one of the projects we're working on actually with our research informatics team is, you know, through our, our EMR um, uh, and, and different uh, technology vendor, you know, um, we're able to provide a, a greater amount of data. So if you think about it as a health system, you know, we see, you know, have about, you know, a million or two uh, uh, encounters every year um, while for, uh, now we're working on a project that'll provide 5.7 billion encounters uh, for the research uh, teams to be able to access. And so um, that excites me. And then maybe the, the second thing that really excites me the most is the advancement and innovation that's happening in this kind of AI space. As mentioned, we've really been kind of ramping up this AI uh, technology innovation in the last um, 10 years. And what you're going to see is, is you know, uh, we talked about trans, uh, transfer learning and different techniques in and training models to be smarter, but you know we are working towards uh, a broader um, AI capabilities. That um, so what's commonly known as a physics-informed AI. So what that means is today we're limited in in, in what's called a deep learning, where you know um, uh, AI can really um, be useful in a set of rules, right? So um, <clears throat> the thing that really made the headlines in the last five years is, you know, um, AI beating Jeopardy contestants or, you know, AI beating masters in a game, what's called the Go game. Um, and, you know, really, if you think about um, machines are really good at learning something deep, but if the real world scenarios that introduces different variables of rules, then it has hard time. But uh, there's actually techniques and innovation now being applied to be able to do that more efficiently. Like I said, we're, we're still about a decade or more away from that, but as the innovation comes to AI forefront that, you know, I can see uh, really helping our patients and, and, and our researchers and providers uh, do their job uh, much more easier to, to help patients. That is cool. Maybe it'll be able to help me do a better job of catching fish when I'm down at the River Life Farm, my favorite place in Southern Missouri. Hey, Alexis Del Smith, Del Sid. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what did I just say? Do we have any reporter questions out there today? Not hearing any. Okay, so we've been talking a long time, Lexis. I bet there's some questions now from the community. We have a lot of questions coming in about AI and also about COVID. Uh, the first one is about AI. It comes from Jean. Jean wants to know, are Alexa and Siri classified as artificial intelligence? Okay. Are uh, Siri, is Siri and Alexa, what do you think? Yes. Yeah, so yes. It's, a, it's a form of re uh, speech recognition systems. All right. I see Harper shaking his head. I think Siri thinks I'm a dummy sometimes. I don't, I don't enunciate. She can't figure out what I just said, but is there hope? Yeah, wow. no, no. Uh, uh, Siri and Alexa is considered uh, um, a part of AI uh, capability. Um, there's uh, different um, techniques like, you know, uh, machine learning or image recognition. So that's the other one that I've um, been advancing quite a bit is with the, the vast amount of uses of camera in our daily lives. 
Uh, there's a lot of uh, digital images that are created, whether it's video or still, and there's a ton of uh, techniques that are created to be able to recognize that as well. So things like uh, Tesla is probably the most uh, easy one to understand is that uh, Tesla collects, I believe, about um, a, a 20 uh, um, a terabytes worth of record every day to be able to translate those images and radar to be able to uh, have that autonomous driving capability. Yeah, that would be cool in the car can drive more safely than I do. Alexis. Isaac has a question. Isaac actually has a concern that he wants to bounce off you, doctors. Uh, Isaac writes, I'm worried about this. I just read a piece in the Washington Post the other day about how AI might cause human extinction. I'm sure the creators of these systems share the same concerns, right? Okay, we're back to those Isaac Asimov's rules of robotics. Uh, Chris Harper, because that, if you read that science fiction world, that, that was part of the concern that was raised about the rise of AI. Talk to us a little bit how we can build in safeguards. Yeah, you know, actually there's a, a, a group that gathers every year um, looking at and, and, and trying to uh, um, have guardrails around different um, AI usage or capabilities so that, um, you know, the goal obviously is to, the ethical use, but also making sure that as, as humans that, that we are being responsible for these technologies. And so they're working to make sure we have the right guardrails in place. Um, you know, like I said, I think, you know, um, I think Terminator is probably the movie that most people reference when we're talking about AI. And, you know, I don't know if we're, we're um, um, close to that, those stages, but, you know, I think really the uh, easiest way to think about AI in, in, in a practical use is that it's just another smart tool that'll enhance our, our daily lives or in our case really helping to take care of patients better so you know um I, you know i'm not smart enough to predict where we will be in 10 to 20 years but i'd say we're pretty far away from that and uh, we have a group of, of smart people that are working every year to be able to put the right guardrails in place all right and star trek discovery season two fortunately commander burnham and captain spock Aaron. Mm -hmm. Mm. Was, I think so Commander Spock in that episode, as well as Captain Pike Save the Universe. Outstanding. <laughs> All right, Alexis. I have a couple COVID questions. Uh, this one's from Amanda. Amanda writes that she has a booster question. She says, I'm Pfizer fully vaxxed, one booster last November, hadn't qualified for another yet. I got COVID at the end of July. Do I need to wait a certain amount of time mm -hmm. before getting this new booster? I took Paxlovid during my COVID infection. She's getting close to the timeline, Hawk. Yeah, you know, I think this is good. This is certainly part of more of the, the, the art of medicine. Certainly the CDC recommendations would be never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Um, I think if we take that a little bit further, so we can start there. Um, and, and now it's really kind of more, more art, esoteric kind of issues. You know, you have gotten a natural boost of infection with uh, or with the infection. So you're getting your spike uh, exposure, so you're developing antibodies and T-cell responses to that, but you're also developing antibodies and T-cell responses to other parts of the virus that you don't see with the vaccine. And I think um, it, it's right on, Steve. You know, you are getting close now to where you probably could get the vaccine. I, I think waiting eight to 12 weeks after your acute infection is probably good. That will give your um, your immune system time to evolve during that, uh, during that period, but also then as your immunity starts to decrease, your antibodies start to contract as they do with any natural infection or vaccination, you can go ahead and get that boost. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think the recommend, uh, what we would say is probably eight to 12 weeks after that acute okay. infection is, is probably reasonable. But again, let's be clear, the CDC recommendations would be never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Yeah, never, never miss the opportunity, Alexis. Another vaccine question. Uh, what's the latest on the nasal spray vaccine? Oh, there was some stuff coming out of Europe and some other countries, about China coming in about the nasal vaccine. Yeah, so I would first start to say by, uh, you know, we have just a few vaccines that are uh, emergency use authorized here in the United States. None of those are from those Chinese companies. Um, we know that intranasal vaccines have been present uh, before, things such as influenza. Um, they sound good, you know, I think we really want to increase those mucosal antibodies, so those antibodies that are, are in your uh, mucosal surfaces, like in your nasal passages, in your respiratory uh, system. Uh, but even those antibodies will wane as well. Those will decrease or contract. Um, certainly the information looks good. If we have a vaccine that helps 
uh, decrease your chance of infection even greater than our current vaccines, which our vaccines do have, uh, current ones do have some minimal protection against infection. But if we can use these intranasal vaccines, I think there's a lot of research to be done still, um, but hopefully uh, they will uh, show that there's benefit to help protecting against infection and even more against uh, severe disease and hospitalization as well. You know, these are big challenges, Alexis, yeah. but yeah. Uh, important questions. Go ahead. Gene wants some clarification on the booster. Uh, Gene wants to know, do the new boosters include BA4 and 5? It's a mix of both BA4 and BA5, Hawk. I, there are some, they, the CDC actually went through that last night. Yeah, and I, um, from what I understand and believe, the BA4, BA5 spike is exactly the same. So it's other changes or mutations or amino acid substitutions in other parts of the viral genome uh, in their proteins that make them a little bit different. Uh, but the spikes are the same, and so that's what the bivalent includes. It includes that first ancestral Wuhan isolate spike, uh, which again, we know ha has caused uh, very good uh, immunity when given in the vaccine, very safe immunity. Uh, and it has that BA4, BA5 spike as well. All right, two more questions, Alexis. Okay, two more questions, and then we have a lot more, so we're gonna try to hang on to those and then answer questions if we don't get to you in our future broadcast. But let's get to this one from Catherine K. Kelly Jackson. She would like to know, are they looking to combine flu and COVID into one shot, mm -hmm. and then with the CDC annual shot recommendation? Yeah. Well, when that, the CDC is saying you can get both shots at the same time, but Hawkeye, they haven't combined the two shots yet. I'm not sure that that's going to happen right away. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. Probably not happen right away. I think even since last year, they were looking for ways, especially with this platform of the mRNA, being able to give those other components of other diseases. We know that vaccines with uh, multi-components, so against, other, against different diseases, uh, we do have those already on different platforms. I know they are certainly looking to do that, um, and there are experiments and trials underway with, say, for instance, influenza and, um, and, and SARS-CoV-2 as well. Uh, but I think it's very early stages. Yeah, and, and you know, even is this, that would be like the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine or DBT, things like that, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Yep, yep. Alexis. We have time for one more. We're going to squeeze in this question from Yen Liang. Yen, Liang. Yen wants to know, one, is it safe to get the mix of old generation vaccines and next generation vaccines? Can you mix them? And then what's the efficacy and how many doses of the next generation vaccine should we get? Yeah, I think we tried to tackle this question we a little did. earlier, yeah. but the bottom yeah. line Simple is it's answer. clearly safe to mix them. We're not worried about that yeah. at all. Yeah. Because remember, it's just adding another spike variation. And if you think about that, that's what we do with influenza vaccinations all okay. the time. Mm -hmm. So not worried about that. Yeah. And Hawkeye, it's one shot of the new vaccine that's not two or three. Correct. At this point in time, it's it's the recommendation for that one booster, yeah. And we don't have, actually, we don't have that much real-world efficacy data in humans at that, about that yet. The mice data looked really strong. But remember, that's also true about influenza shots every year when we get those, uh, 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 those things. So the thing that will that could affect the outcomes the most is if there's another variant where the spikes changed a lot. We don't see that in Horizon right now, which is why they settled on the B4, B5. Okay. We're going to go around the horn just a minute and get final thoughts from our guests. But before we do that, I want to give you another example about artificial intelligence that went viral in April. Some folks thought it might be an April Fool's joke, but it's not. Researchers in Hong Kong have developed robotic magnetic slime. No, this is not Ghostbusters. They say it holds extreme potential in many areas from electrical to medical. The slime can apparently conduct electricity and grab onto small objects, which scientists think might come in handy to retrieve batteries from small children that they may swallow. The robotic slime is not yet, not yet ready for human consumption, but this is the final frontier, and it is amazing to explore and to follow, which is what we love to do on Show Me the Science. This has been a great discussion, and I'm really looking forward to more Show Me the Science episodes. These are my favorite programs because I learn a ton, and we get to the coolest people down here to talk about that. Let's get final thoughts from our guests. First, Dr. May Lu. Dr. Lu. So I think there are definitely pros and cons to AI, like everything else, but I'm really looking forward to its good use in medicine to finally improve patient outcomes. Yeah, I think that is so cool. Dr. Alan Yule. Uh, yeah, Dr. Alan Yule. Thanks for having me on the show, Steve. Uh, it's, as a clinician, it's always fun to have smart people 
bringing in new technologies to apply to clinical medicine. It's really thrilling. It, it, it is a thrill. And to be able to work in a place that does that, that's like, that's like just kind of this mental high all the time. Dana Hawkinson. Yeah, again, I think um, a lot of good information coming out, a lot of good questions about the boosters. You know, again, it's fairly simple. If you were 12 and over and you are two months out from your last dose of vaccine, uh, you are able to get that updated booster. I think those questions are good about recent infection because we know there has been so many recent infections around our community. Um, so we will keep uh, answering those questions and keep up to date with the, with the latest information about boosters. And here at the health system, we should be getting our first shipment of the updated boosters on September 14th. So we will be able to give those out at that point. They're starting to ship and we yeah. believe we're gonna have, I, I just learned yesterday, it's like we're gonna get 2,000 doses, follow up 3,000 doses, followed by a bunch more right after that. So we're yep. gonna have plenty of vaccination. So we'll see VS Walgreens and all those places you've been getting vaccinated so far. My final thought for the day is this, I am going to come back next week, uh, studio crew, remember this. We're going to show the robotic laws from Isaac Asimov. That's cool stuff mm. about AI. <laughs> you know, we can always be afraid of new things, but we remember we're the drivers of the new things. We, we just got to get it right, and we can do that. Because every time we advance science and we save lives and we can cure something like, like prevent acute kidney injury, we have made the quality of life so much better just as vaccination has made the quality of life so much better for so many folks, as have Paxlovid, as have all the treatments, as do the rules of infection prevention and control. Giving middle and high school students the tools and help they need to deal with a mental health crisis or stress. The largest mental health training program in the state of Kansas is now underway at one school district. Alexis Del Cid joins us once again with that story. Alexis. This is such a cool program. It's called Mental Health First Aid Training. And this program is the first of its kind in the metro. It's the first of its kind in the whole state of Kansas. Coaches, along with program sponsors like people with the debate team, theater, athletic trainers in the Blue Valley School District took part in a special training course yesterday. That happened in Overland Park. The goal is to make these people who are attending first responders when it comes to mental health. Also, another goal is simply to teach students in middle and high schools that it's okay to reach out for support. It's okay to open up if you're struggling. During this day-long training session, the group learned about a mental health action plan. And this is the plan that includes training these staff members to know, one, how to help a student who needs assistance with their mental health, but also give them the tools so they can refer a child or a teen who needs help with whatever resources are available. The creator of the plan, Caitlin True, says many people might not realize the stresses that teens deal with every day. It's constant. Stressors can include social media. That is a huge one. And also simply trying to live up to other people's expectations. I know I experience stress with classes and performing well on tests, so there's anxiety to be you know, a high performer in school. Um, there is the stress surrounding being a performer um, on the field. You know, let's say um, a kid uh, was really successful as a freshman and a sophomore, and you know, as we all grow, our body develops and changes, and they might not be as successful, and so there's that pressure. The district has done mental health training before this, but really nothing to this extent. Blue Valley leaders say this training session is only the beginning. It's the tip of the iceberg. They plan to teach everyone in the district about a mental health plan by the end of this school year. Now to another big topic, and we're talking about childhood cancer research. Did you know that childhood cancer research is grossly underfunded? It gets less than 4% of the National Cancer Institute's budget less than 4%. For one Metro mom whose son got cancer, she wasn't just gonna stand by and do nothing. She got busy. She created an organization known as Braden's Hope. And tonight is their night at Kauffman Stadium. I talked with the vice chancellor and director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center and the creator of Braden's Hope. I'm here with Delise Hofen and Dr. Jensen. Delise, I wanna start with you. You had a close walk with cancer. How did this bring about Braden's Hope? Our son, Braden was diagnosed with cancer when he was three. There were fairly poor odds for his survival at that time, but we got through his first cancer 
treatment, uh, which was about a year and a half long. And then after that, he relapsed. His cancer came back and his odds fell even worse. So he had about a 10% chance for survival for five years at that time. Three months later, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. I was really lucky because I had all sorts of treatments available to me that would go in and attack the cancer cells that I had. But Braden faced no known cure. And I was talking with a bunch of my friends and they were like, this is crazy. Why would you have more treatments and he wouldn't have? treatments available to him. And so I started researching and what I found out was that childhood cancer research is very overlooked and underfunded. You have walked through the fire. You've been through it and you are channeling it for such great things and you have some amazing events happening in September to raise awareness for childhood cancer research. Can you talk about those? Tonight on the 7th of September, we actually have a Royals for a Cause game that is a childhood cancer awareness game, and it's gonna be amazing. We're trying to gold out Kauffman Stadium, bring as many people as we can. There'll be a lot of kids there that have fought cancer, and it'll be a really special night. Then the 18th of September, we have our 5K, 10K that will be at Corporate Woods. We're excited about that. It's called Hope on the Hill. And then our final event at the end of the month is our Hope Gala, and it's on September 24th. I wanna bring in Dr. Jensen to talk about this partnership with the Cancer Center, Braden's Hope, and Children's Mercy, and how this has impacted pediatric cancer research in our area. We have been working with Children's Mercy for several years now, and Braden's Hope came along and really served to catalyze many of our most exciting research efforts along the pediatric oncology lines, and they have funded three different investigators that we think are really at the cutting edge of pediatric cancer research. And that was in, made entirely possible by the Braden's Hope effort. And so we consider them one of our most valuable partners. And obviously our relationship with Children's Mercy has been going on for a number of years now and was critical to getting our center to comprehensive status because one of the criteria that they look at is the ability of our cancer center to address cancer across the lifespan. And so obviously Children's Mercy plays a critical role for our pediatric patients. Delise and Dr. Jensen, thank you so much. That is gonna be a great night at the K tonight. Thank you so much for joining us this morning here on Open Mics. And remember, you can catch our updates anytime just by logging on to Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. We will see you back here tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Go out and make it a great day. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. You don't think of puppy kisses and wagging tails as medicine, but it can be. I'm Jessica Lovell. Studies show Fido isn't just a distraction for patients in pain, but a way to ease stress and lower blood pressure. We'll take you inside the hospital's pet therapy program, Thursday at 8. Coming up Thursday on All Things Heart. I remember getting into the back of the ambulance and that was it. The one thing his wife did from miles away that doctors say was just as important as their work in the OR. We hear from the stroke survivor and the life-saving information from his doctors. Thursday morning at 10. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available. Thank you.